Welcome, everyone, to today's episode of Getting In, a College Coach Conversation. I'm Sally Ganga from College Coach, um, and I'm hoping that some of you listening are interested in a bachelor's in music or in musical theater, because we're going to be talking all about that today. Um, and in fact, for my first segment, if you're watching this video, you'll see um, Charlie Murphy, who's the director of Musical Theater College Auditions. Um, so we're going to be chatting with him for the first segment. And he's using his own experience as a graduate of Carnegie Mellon's extremely impressive BFA program in musical theater and his experience as a current actor to help students applying to these programs. For my second segment, I'll be talking with Kurt Isaacson, musician and former admission officer at California Institute of the Arts, as well as one of my colleagues here at Bright Horizons College Coach. And then for my last segment, I'll be talking with college coach veteran and finance expert Alex Bickford about asking for more scholarship money. So that's going to be relevant for everybody, even if you're not interested in music. Mm -hmm. All right. So welcome, Charlie. Thanks so much for joining me today. So honored to be joining you. Excited to chat about the theater process. Absolutely. Listen, I gave a little bit of your background, but I was hoping that you could kind of expand on that and then go into telling me about your organization. Like, like, how are you, you know, how are you able to help students with this area? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, I started, I, those watching the video are going to see I'm very young for having been doing this for 20 years. <laughs> um, but I started about 20 years ago, you know, this very complicated process, which has become its own beast for anyone who's kind of looking at the, the theater world. We do mostly acting and musical theater um, applications. But this process has become so complicated and we, our company sort of sprung up around the need that was there for families just to help navigate this process. I mean, the college process as a whole, of course, as we know, and you know very well, is, yeah. is so complicated. But then there's this whole other extra wing of it when you're looking at audition-based programs. So as these uh, students were, were noticing they were getting more and more competitive, they're adding more and more schools, they just needed guidance. And that's, of course, what we've been doing for the past 20 years. And we've sort of formed our company around the needs of the process and, and what the students were, were looking for. Mm -hmm. I have to say, I wish I'd known about you 10 years ago because I had a student applying into musical theater programs and it worked out great for her. She went yep. to the Hart School at University yep. of Hartford. Great school. I had no idea how to help her. And yep. that aspect, I mean, I could help her with the general college admission, but yep. her process was so stressful that it made every other student I've worked with like look like it was, it was chill. That. <laughs> All the time. So, and from so many expert guidance counselors, expert college coaches who know the college process really well, they'll say, How many schools are you looking at? What? I don't understand. You know, because mm -hmm. this process is, you know, it is insane. I, you know, you hear some of people quote like Harvard or MIT or some of those incredibly competitive schools. Carnegie Mellon, which, you know, uh, I went to uh, now many years ago, wasn't quite as competitive back then, but they often accept less than 1% of their applicants. I mean, the numbers are just insane. And yeah. so you need a lot of schools if you're going to give yourself a chance. And I think it's also difficult because unlike MIT or Harvard, where the student might be able to almost self-select themselves out or in based mm -hmm. on their SATs, it is such a subjective process. You know, even if you do seek an expert artistic coach, we're not going to be able to tell you you're for sure a Michigan student. You're for sure a Hart student. You're for sure a Carnegie Mellon student. We don't know. It, it, mm -hmm. You know, you got to walk in the audition room and actually book the the audition. We can say, hey, you, you're more competitive or less competitive in terms of, of your artistic work, but there is a lot of subjectivity and there's a lot of kind of throwing paint against the wall in the process. Yeah. Yeah. Which is why they have to apply to so many. Yeah. And really like with, a, with that low of an acceptance rate, you have to assume that no matter how talented you are, you actually have to assume you're not going to get in. That's right. Which is so heart wrenching for a teenager. I mean, it's bad enough for an adult, oh. but for a teenager. Though I'll say great preparation for the profession they're potentially yes. walking into. If you want to be an actor, we always say it's like, great. Ooh, I got to take another rejection today. Okay, that's good training for me because it's going to happen. Even to, we do have students who maybe pass all of their pre-screens. Pre-screens is a big part of the, the process where you have to, you first send a video in before you can even do the, the live audition. But almost nobody's going to escape the process completely unscathed of mm -hmm. some big rejection and some heartache and some, I was hoping it was going to be this and it ended up here. Even though most people do end up really happy with what their fit ends up being, mm -hmm. you're going to take some rejection along the way. It's just, you know, nobody's for everybody. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly right. All right. So tell me, um, tell me a bit more about what your organization does to help students. Like how can they get in touch with you? At what point in the process should they be in touch? All that good stuff. 
Well, you know, so we are a team of working artists. So we're, we have a pretty large team. Many, they're all actively working in the business. And so, you know, that's part of the reason why they're large is some of them are off on Broadway and they're not working with us. And then some are in and out. And, you know, we sort of match our team to the um, student themselves that we meet. Uh, we'll meet you at any point in the process. It's certainly helpful for us to meet you earlier. Um, and we sort of form a pretty a la carte uh, service based on what you need. We can do soup to nuts with you. We can, you mm -hmm. know, help you through the whole process. We always talk about we can help you artistically, organizationally, strategically, and psychologically. The sort of four main buckets of the of this difficult process. Primarily, people will come to us artistically for help with monologues, songs, dance combination. You know, if you're going to do musical theater specifically, we help musical theater and acting applicants. But if you're doing musical theater, you're going to need to prepare at least two or three monologues, two or three songs, and that's at least you're likely going to want more than that. A 60 second dance combination and this new thing called a wild card where it's like a basically a video essay where you have to show soft could be a talent or some special skill or some interest of yours that you're going to show off in a video. So it's a lot to prepare. And then a lot of the parents will also want help with the organization and the strategy of how do we apply to schools. But but based on what you have, we'll help you with whatever you need. You know, some students we help completely and some will just do their monologues or just do their songs if they're they have a home dance teacher that they like or that kind of thing. We're not you don't have to work exclusively with us. We'll we'll help you with whatever you need. Mm -hmm. OK. All right. Good. And nice that there is that option out there. So what do musical theater? So this is one of the things that I run into kind of a surprising amount so I, it shouldn't surprise me, but it does. Students who are like, well, I'm thinking about musical theater or, or majoring in theater or mm -hmm. whatever it might be. And I say, OK, are you thinking about like a BFA program, mm -hmm. a mm -hmm. conservatory program? Or are you thinking about doing it within the context of a liberal arts degree? And they're like, what's the difference? Oof. You know, and I'm like, OK, you got to figure that out really soon really because soon. it makes a big difference. So maybe talk a little bit about that. Like who's going to be what is a musical theater program, BFA type? And what does it take? Um who might be appropriate for that kind of a program? Because it's going to be very different from just very a general good. degree. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of our students, if you're listening to your sophomore or junior, you might not know exactly. And a lot of our mm -hmm. students start with us and they go, we're going to look at the broad range of, of those different programs you mentioned. Some will focus really narrowly on, on a certain kind of BFA. Some know they're looking at a broad BA. You know, mm -hmm. the buckets that we kind of lump them into, and I almost like to think of it more as a spectrum than to really categorize them into buckets, but there are these really BFA conservatory style programs. Carnegie Mellon is kind of an odd example. Carnegie Mellon is a BFA conservatory style program, even though, of course, we know there's a really good academic university there. Mm -hmm. But we say conservatory style, meaning that 90 some percent of your classes are going to be in the acting musical theater world. So you're not take, getting a minor, you're not double majoring, mm -hmm. you're really focusing. Sometimes we'll say it's like you're going to Hogwarts, like you're learning magic all day. At Hogwarts, <laughs> they don't do a lot of like English and math. Right, you, right. you think they need math still, but they don't seem to do it at Hogwarts. Right? Right. It's really a lot of singing, dancing, acting almost all the time, right? Then if you move along the spectrum, and, and there's some that are in that 90%, some it's 100%. There are some places where it's like you have literally two gen ed requirements and that's it. Everything else is in the theater world. So those are the more extreme BFA conservatories, some of which aren't even affiliated with university. So mm -hmm. sometimes you'll end up with a conservatory that's just, just a conservatory. And, you know, the Juilliard School is not really mm -hmm. a university, right? Those kind of things. Um, and then you move along that, you know, if you look at schools like University of Michigan, um, NYU, those are what we call BFA liberal art programs, still mm -hmm. a BFA program, but now it is possible to minor, it is even possible to double major, right? So you're still going to get what we call conservatory style training, meaning intensive professional training, but you can potentially get significantly more academics than you're going to get at those BFA conservatory style program. And then you'll have audition based BAs, which that audition based I think is, is important in terms of the caliber of your classmates and how that's going to change things. So schools like American University is an audition based BA. And then you'll have non audition BAs, which is basically the rest of colleges where you can still major in theater, you can still a, a study theater at almost any school in the country. Mm -hmm. It's just going to be a, at a much less kind of professional feeling level. If you're on that that far right side of the spectrum in the non audition BAs. That does not mean, as we all know, that you can't be a successful actor having gone to a non-audition BA program. You know, Lin-Manuel Miranda went to a non-audition program right. and then wrote Hamilton. So it's not like you can't be an amazing performer, but you're not going to be coming in at that, that professional level. So I think when you talk about the kind of student, where do you fall on the spectrum? I think it's about how certain are you that you want to, at 22, be hitting New York City and auditioning for shows. You know, if you're not 100% certain, then I wouldn't say you're a good candidate for the BFA Conservatory. But if you know you want to eat, breathe and sleep musical theater, then probably your list shouldn't be filled with tons of BAs. You, you probably want more of those BFA style programs. 
Mm-hmm. You know, and then of course there's always the tension, I'm sure as you know, is sometimes the student really wants nothing but the acting, singing, dancing, and the parent says, I'd really love a double major. That's where you might find some of those more compromised schools. Yeah, yeah. And it's good to know that those more compromised schools are out there. But I love what you're saying here. Like, do you eat, sleep, and breathe this? Mm-hmm. Or is this something that you it's fun for you to do and you want to keep doing it on some level. If that's the case, a lot of colleges are going to make that available to you and you can still have your chemistry major or whatever it might be. But if this is all you want to do, that's when you look at those programs. And we find sometimes that throughout the process, people will kind of learn that about themselves. So sometimes you'll start with a broader list. That's again, why sometimes these lists end up so big is because people aren't hundred percent certain. So they have a little bit of A, B and C in the list and they'll learn from doing it oh no, I do want this all day Mm -hmm. or the opposite. Sometimes all students go through and go, that was really fun. I even got into this really competitive BFA school, Mm -hmm. but I realized I'm not ready to commit. I do still want to study psychology. I do still want criminal justice. I do want this Mm -hmm. other thing. And so then they they end up at a Northwestern. They end up at a different kind of school where it's a little bit broader and they can get more academics. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what are kind of best practices for students who do want these schools? What are some of the things that you would encourage them to, like how make themselves more competitive? And I'm Mm -hmm. also kind of curious about, like common pitfalls, what are sort of mistakes that students make over and over again? Not the same student, but you you see it over and over again yeah. that students do this again and again. I think it's really hard. And, you know, this is not to denigrate any high school acting teacher, some of whom I know and who are amazing. I think there are some old ideas. When we talk about pitfalls, there are some old ideas about sort of theater and musical theater in terms of conversations around type and what they think colleges are expecting that sometimes end up being traps for um, students. You know, I'm sure at some point I'm going to brag about my podcast and something I talk all about. You should. Uh, the, I will. That's what we're <laughs> yeah, here for. Right? Do, yeah. um, I talk to all these college faculty and they'll say it again and again. We are not looking for specific types. If you look like a young ingenue, you don't have to come in and sing a sweet princess kind of song, you know. So I think sometimes people will get trapped into going, I think this school is looking for um, you know, or maybe they have the guidance from a high school teacher saying, I think I need to act a certain way. I think I need to do this kind of material because that's what's quote unquote appropriate for me. And that's what I've been told I'm supposed to do. And again, sometimes it's not, I, I don't want to blame the high school teacher or the, the the guidance. Sometimes it's also just a little easier from the student perspective to go, give me the right answer. And then they'll go, okay, I'll take the right answer. These are the right schools. These are the mm-hmm. right, you know, as if um, it's that simple of a process. So that's maybe the pitfall. And I guess the reverse of that is like, What you want to do as a student is to like go in there and as much as possible authentically reveal the young artist that you are. Like that's what the colleges actually, they all talk about looking for. We're looking for potential. We're not looking for perfect performers. We don't need you to be on Broadway at 18 years Mm -hmm. old. You know, they want to see your potential, but they also really want to see who you are, right? That's where I think it's not that different than the normal college process. And we talk about your essay and you talk about, you know, it's like you're not trying to write toward what you think the people want to hear, you want to write with some your own voice and your your own authenticity. It's very similar to that in terms of the monologues you choose, the songs you choose, you know, show what kind of artist you are. And then the colleges get to go, oh, cool. Maybe I want a little more of this, a little less of this, right? They'll get to have a little bit more input in it if you're revealing who you are, as opposed to if you think the University of Michigan only takes these kind of people. And so then you try to be that kind of person now you're kind of showing them something that's inauthentic and and then they'll never get to decide whether they actually want to meet you or not. Mm-hmm. I love that. And and I think the, the correlation with the general applications is exactly right. I talk to students every day who think, well, I should do this. I've heard internships are good. And mm-hmm. I'm like, well, your interest is being an English major. So what kind of, an, you know, they're like, but I heard science research uh-huh. is good. I'm like, well, if you want to major in science, it is, but not if you want to do something That's completely right. different, there are options. So yep. start with who you are always, always, always. I think that's so crucial. And I love that you're I'm reinforcing that because it's also just a good lesson for them as a human being. It's not going to work if you're trying to do something that you're not, it's so you true. know, so yeah. And then how can students reduce the stress in, I mean, it's going to be stressful. I think we know very clearly that it will be, but like, how can they reduce the stress to the extent possible? I do think that's where, you know, starting earlier is helpful. It's not that you need to start earlier necessarily as a competitive advantage, but for your own sanity, and especially to the parents out there, for your own sanity, you know, when we meet juniors now, as we talk in February, it is much easier to show a whole roadmap of the process. Can you begin your essays a little bit early? Let's start picking material a little sooner before you go off for the summer. You know, that kind of stuff makes the process much easier so that you're not doing it 
all in a big rush, right? I do think chunking it up can can make it helpful. You know, I also think I've been talking about this a lot with our students because more and more of them have anxiety and you know, feel like they're so nervous and scared of the process that they need to do 30 schools or some, you know, insane number of schools because they go, that's the only way I can be sh sure that I'm gonna gonna do well. And I do think that's where you gotta find your balance of going, you gotta do your best, but you also have to have a little bit of of trust and belief that like you're gonna show up for yourself and that you're gonna you're gonna go through this process uh, you know, with with integrity. And that if you can do that. You know, you don't have to game the system to go, what are all my possible double checks and triple checks? And, you know, that at some point you go, you you do trust the process and trust you've done the work and then try to enjoy the process as opposed to sp going, is there one more essay I could write? Could I do one more application? At some point you got to go, I've done enough. I've done it. I'm going to let the mm -hmm. chips fall where they may. Mm -hmm. And that actually leads in beautifully to my last question, which is, what if a student can't get into a top program? I mean, yeah. like one of these where the admit rate is below 4%, right? We've kind of touched on that, but there are other options. So what kinds yes. of things might you advise a student to do to have a so-called safety program, for example? Yeah. So we always talk about balance lists. So having a, a large number of those very competitive programs because of the subjectivity, you don't want to just have one or two reaches in the old, mm -hmm. you know, you'd want to have a number of schools so you give yourself a real chance at it. But then having a good number, you know, at least six or seven of those schools that are not the most competitive schools in the country you know, it's not, they're never going to be a complete safety because there's always a little bit of risk. But I do think in giving yourself enough of those schools, you will ultimately find your fit. And that would be my big advice is you don't want to fool yourself into a competitive program that's not interested in you and that you might not be right for. It might be that your path is actually best for a school where you're going to be a little bit of a bigger fish and you, mm -hmm. you're going to fit in a little bit more given where you are in the process and them going, I think I'm ready to teach you and you're ready to learn from me. Often that actually ends up being a much better fit than the school that you think you wanted when you started the process. Mm -hmm. I actually know somebody who went to, I went to Reed College of Small College in Portland, Oregon, and a friend of mine was absolutely the big fish in the theater department. He directed plays, he wrote yep. plays, he was able to do everything because he was the guy. Yep. And you know what? He got a job in theater after he graduated running a small community theater, which was yep. actually exactly what he wanted to do. <laughs> so... You know, um, totally I sense, mean, yeah. I think, you know, there are times when that, you know, that was definitely for him. That was the right option. So, yep. um, all right. Any last thing that you want to tell me before? Uh, I mean, certainly plug your podcast. Gotta but, plug the podcast. Yeah, Come gotta on. plug the podcast. <laughs> so do that. But also, is there any anything I didn't ask about that I should have, like any last piece of advice? Or do you feel like we covered things pretty well? Um, I'll plug the podcast and then I'll give maybe a little advice to the parents as well. Um, I will say that that podcast really is a resource, especially for any sophomores, juniors, or even seniors who are looking at the process, looking at schools. We sort of do two kinds of episodes. We do one kind of episode interviewing the faculty, primarily the faculty who are the ones auditioning you at these schools. Um, mm -hmm. And one of the reasons we started that just as a resource is that it's a little easier, I think, than looking at the websites, which can tend to be very, varied and you're reading some of the same text but it means different things where you can where you can actually hear from the you know mouths of the faculty members get their vibes see what they're actually like and then get the specific information about all those different programs so that's half the episodes and then the other, other half of the episodes we talk with professional actors about their paths through college and how they've become successful some of those are a little more geared toward our alumni students who are in college and out of college mm -hmm. but certainly i know a lot of our high school students will also listen to those and go oh it's jesse mueller and how did she make navigate it through or annalee ashford or some of these cool fancy people people and how do they navigate their college process mm -hmm. um, and where do they find the podcast like what's the name of it again it's and called everything? mapping the college edition mapping the college edition found wherever you find podcasts on apple mm -hmm. and stitcher i don't think stitchers exist anymore but it <laughs> feels like something that people say spotify whatever you can find it where you right 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 yeah uh, podcast mapping the college edition is what it's called okay. um and then maybe I'll just wrap with a little bit of parent advice because I know so many of our listeners, at least I found, are parents who are listening for their their students and for their children, um, which is, I'll just pass on the advice that I hear again and again. I ask all of the faculty and ask all of the, the, the artists, you know, what what do you wish about your parents or what, what advice would you give to parents? And they always talk about, if it's possible, if it's in you, and I had parents who were not the most supportive of my own theatrical dreams, but if it's in you, to support what your child's actual dream is, you know, and again, with your knowledge and with, you know, that doesn't mean that you can't encourage them to still go to a university or, or encourage them about the expertises that you have. But if you can really try to listen to your kid, if you've got a budding actor and they've got that dream, 
and try to do whatever you can to get on the same page and be a team in supporting their dream, even if there are stipulations. Again, that's not to say that you just have to bow down to exactly what they want, whether that's money or whether that's the, the kind of school. But if you can try to find a way to kind of align your goals and really hear what your, your child's goals are, it's just going to save you a lot of time and energy because in the end, your kid's going to win. It's, the sad thing is like, your kid's going to do what they're going to do almost certainly, or they're going to resent you for it, you know? Mm -hmm. And so it's like, the faster you can get on board and go, how do I help support this child through the experience, um, I think you'll just have a better relationship as you go through your senior mm -hmm. year. Well, I think that's wonderful advice in general. And I talk about par parents who uh, have a budding history major might have the similar concerns. Uh, I and I, I it, yeah. speak as a history major in college. So it works out, support them and what their particular path is. So, yeah. all right. Well, listen, thank you so much, Charlie. I really appreciate it. It was my pleasure, Sally. Thanks for the chat. All right, when we return, I'll be welcoming Kurt Isaacson. So come on back.